FM 2030 was a visionary, but he could not have imagined that two short years after his death, his ideas would be brought to prominence by reactionary opponents of progress, warning against the coming of techno-sapien post-humanity. Although FM 2030 had long been championed by the small transhumanist subculture that he helped birth, it wasn't until 2002, with the publication of Our Post-Human Future by the influential conservative intellectual Francis Fukuyama, and the appointment of Leon Cass as chair of the President's Council on Bioethics that determined critics of the transhuman transition were suddenly at the pinnacle of Washington punditry, working with the Christian right to fight all the trends that FM had taught were inevitable and welcome. Political globalization, animal rights, the decline of the nuclear family, and our imminent post-human, post-biological existence. FM 2030 was born Faridun M. Esfandiari in Belgium in 1930 son of an Iranian diplomat and part of the aristocratic Esfandiari clan intermarried with the Shah. His childhood was spent in consulates, embassies, and government outposts around the world. His formal education began in an Iranian primary school, continued in an English school, a French Jesuit school in Jerusalem, and a term in a girls' convent school in Lebanon, where he was the only boy. In the late 1940s, after attending schools in Europe, he went to the United States and attended Berkeley, then UCLA. He came to London in 1948 as a member of the Iranian fencing team at the Olympic Games. FM served at the United Nations on the Conciliation Commission for Palestine, later leaving to devote his time to writing. Day of Sacrifice, FM's first novel, was selected by the New York Herald Tribune as one of the best novels of 1959. It's been translated into 11 languages and is on the required reading list of the U.S. State Department. The critique of social conditions in Iran in Day of Sacrifice and his next novel, The Beggar, made it difficult for FM to return to Iran, however. In his third novel, Identity Card, a man searches for every possible way to obtain an identity card that will allow him to leave Iran. In the mid-1960s, FM moved from writing novels to writing nonfiction about the future, and in the process, he changed his name to FM 2030. Why do you have the name FM 2030? Well, for one thing, the future is unusual, right? And I'm a futurist. I spend a lot of my time in the future. And somewhat a long years ago, I decided maybe it's time to jettison my old conventional name and adopt something that evokes the future. And since I spend so much of my time surfing across the decades to come, I decided to pick a name like 2030, meaning the year 2030, which, according to my best uh, projections, will be an exciting time. Uh, space colonization, people flitting from one space colony or lunar base to another, and agelessness, really people living indefinitely, and so forth and so on, and a lot of abundance and so forth. Anyway, a lot of problems that exist today will certainly non exist then, or will be in phase out. We'll have a lot of other problems, but certainly not the problems that we are mired in now. And so, that's, that's the reason. Uh, oh, names, conventional names, usually evoke uh, nationality, territoriality, occupation, religion, ethnicity, and so forth. And these are really things that I jettisoned a long time ago. Over the next 30-odd years, FM 2030 would become known for provocative visions of the future. He spread his ideas through teaching futurist philosophy at New School for Social Research and UCLA, guest lecturing at the Smithsonian Institution, writing opinion pieces for the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times, and appearing on television shows such as The Today Show, Good Morning America, Live with Larry King, and Future Watch. In the 1970s, FM 2030 penned his futurist trilogy, Telespheres, Upwingers, and Optimism One, The Emerging Radicalism. He also started the Upwinger organization to discuss and promote radical optimism about an openness to the future. For instance, FM and the Upwingers were sure that radical life extension would be achieved in the 21st century. We began our interview with the man who calls himself FM 2030 at, of all places, a hospital. The same Atlanta hospital where he'd undergone emergency surgery just a few weeks earlier. FM says in the future, hospitals won't just fix our ailing bodies, they'll issue replacements. We will not only be able to replace very nearly any part, any malfunctioning part of the body, but we'll be able to do something infinitely more, I think, exciting. And that is, we just give the person a new body. Whole body. 
whole body. Right. Yeah, yeah. Replacement body. One fell swoop or piece by piece? Well, either way. And probably both ways. FM says the number of people walking around today with transplanted organs, artificial limbs, and synthetic body parts is proof that the ultimate makeover is only a matter of time. You know, if we are able to build bridges and ships and even buildings that last for hundreds of years, why can't we build bodies that can last for hundreds of years? Or bodies that can be easily jettisoned or easily replaced? And I believe we will. Millions of people around no longer have the old, pristine, specifically biological bodies. Our bodies are now, uh, they have a lot of synthetic parts, right? And uh, which enable people to go on living. People would have been dead and gone 10, 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now have replacement parts which enable them to move on. Spare parts. Mm -hmm. If, for example, one's kidney doesn't work, jettison it and get a new one. If your liver doesn't work, if your uh, uh, knee or whatever, the point is that we are uh, grafting mm -hmm. and incorporating increasingly non-biological parts to our bodies. And where will this all lead to? Well, as I see it, using my remote scanners, uh, is that in the coming years and decades, we'll move toward the... Uh, totally non-biological bodies which will enable us to live indefinitely in the future. So mm -hmm. a confluence of all these things and of also the creation of ultra-intelligent systems mm -hmm. uh, which one day will enable us to piggyback on them and, and, and coast into the future. A lot of all these things happening at the same time will in the coming years help propel us toward a new entity, a post-biological extraterrestrial uh, entity which by no stretch of definition can be called human. Um, we've, we've come a long ways from the old sexism and racism. I think we're also going to outgrow ageism in the 1990s as more and more people live longer and longer. And as I get older, I hope so. <laughs> well, yes, you're still a young, um, young kid, yeah. but the point is that uh, more and more people are, you know, uh, uh, living to their 80s and 90s and 100 and this is going to keep expanding and accelerating. For example, recently I noticed that a man in his 60s was considered the sexiest person in America, a uh, movie actor. Uh, ten years ago it was a person in their 50s. Another ten years it will be a person in their 70s. And uh, so how old one is will matter less and less. Uh, am I too old for this? Am I too young for this? Am I too young for this person? Am I too old for this person? You know, all these will begin to phase out as people stay younger longer. In fact, there's a term that NIH came up with, not my term, by the way, called youth creep. Not a terribly elegant term, but the idea is that youth is creeping up. People are staying younger longer than ever. And then coast for another 20, 30 years. And then let me tell you, my dear ones, if you're around in the year 2030, 2040, no matter what your age, no matter what your condition, you will be able to coast to indefinite lifespans. Now, I said this 30 years ago in the New York Times interview, some of you may remember, at the time we gave courses at the New School, and as we get closer to the year 2010, let me reiterate a prediction made then. If you're around in the year 2010, there's a very good chance you'll be around in the year 2030. If you're around in the year 2030, there's a very good chance you'll be able to live indefinitely. Unfortunately, despite a very healthy lifestyle, on July 8, 2000, at the age of 69, FM 2030 succumbed to pancreatic cancer. He was put into cryonic suspension at the Alcor Life Extension Foundation in Scottsdale, Arizona, where he remains today. FM, like many cryonauts, was very optimistic that future nanotechnology would be able to repair and revive his frozen brain and body. Now, could you explain cryonics? What is well, exactly? for example, currently, if a person dies or is about to die, we, we allow the person to really go, go forever. We either bury the person or we let this person be uh, cremated. Well, this is a terrible waste, and as I see, it's an irreversible waste. There is no way you can bring this person back. And uh, whereas, you know, cryonics, life suspension, uh, and life support systems, which are, by the way, available in hospitals and so on, are going to be two methods to allow individuals who are either near death or who actually have died to be put in suspension, to be put on hold until a time, 10, 20, 30 years from now, 
when in fact we will be able to reanimate the person and uh, correct the flaw or the breakdown or whatever the glitch was and have the person go on living. Have they defrosted anyone yet? They haven't, de de <laughs> they haven't reanimated anyone. <laughs> reanimated. There are a lot of people Defrosted. walking around who need de de <laughs> defrosting, yes. as it is. Right. Uh, who need throwing out. <laughs> a lot of people in government, for example. But uh, the thing is, uh, <laughs> we have p people in suspension. Or not Well, we have a lot of people in suspension, but nobody has been brought out. Although I need to add that at hospitals, for example, through a lot of what is called emergency techniques, people who have drowned have been brought back. So we are already reanimating the dead. Cardio, uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, for example, is a case in point, either manual or using technology. Defibrillators, pacemakers, etc., enable people, for example, who would have been dead and gone 10 or 20 years ago to be reanimated or to go on functioning. So we are really living at an extraordinary time, extraordinary breakthroughs and advances in all areas of life, um, both in technology as well as in our values, in our level of humanity. And all these things are happening. But the main thing, the main thing to do is to ask yourself, what does all this mean to me? How am I faring in this environment of, uh, this dynamic environment? Am I moving along? Am I staying progressive? In the 1950s, the biologist Julian Huxley had defined transhumanism as humanism which takes seriously the idea of humanity transcending itself. But it was FM 2030 who popularized the concepts of post and transhumanity as logical and attractive next steps, especially with his 1989 book, Are You a Transhuman? What do you mean by the title, transhuman? It means the stage beyond the human. This very day, there are scientists who, through, let's say, bio biological engineering and genetics and uh, robotics and uh, uh, what we call transgenesis and so forth, creating the beginnings of what will eventually be life forms more advanced, more uh, refined, more evolved than us humans, including ourselves, by the way, Larry. And in the process, less and less human, FM 2030 says yes. The fact that we're no longer of this planet only, and the fact that we're no longer confined to these bodies leads me to foresee a time very short, very, very shortly, I'd say in the coming two, three decades, when in fact by no stretch of imagination, by no stretch of definition, can anyone be called human. We are already trans-biological, trans-solar beings, and uh, therefore we are transhuman. And even transhuman is not a fine, our final destination. It's just a transitional phase from the human to something infinitely more advanced, infinitely more refined, infinitely more sophisticated. And that is the post-humans of the middle of the 21st century. What is a transhuman? Transhuman, you know, way back in the uh, 1960s, uh, a lot of things were happening at the same time, like we had the beginning of the space colonization, or rather space program. We had uh, uh, accelerated pace in mm -hmm. implantology and prostheses and replacement parts and so forth. In addition, there seemed to be a whole new spirit and new set of values struggling to come to the fore and all. And the thought occurred to me, registered on my screen, that maybe what was happening was that we were moving toward the creation of or emergence as entirely new beings. Mm -hmm. uh, humans, uh, we humans, uh, are uh, specific products of this specific planet. Mm -hmm. We are earthlings, we are terrestrial beings. But you know, we're no longer really terrestrial, right? This very moment, as you and I talk, there are several fellow humans, actually transhumans, who are out in, in Earth orbit. Well, they don't know they're called transhumans, though. They don't know. <laughs> but we who have the big picture on our screens, we uh -huh. know that they, they ain't humans. You're saying we will become, we'll move beyond transhuman, which is the movement occurring right now, into post-human. Right. Where we're partially human and partially a mechanical operative, like partly computer, well, partly animated to function. Well, listen, when you talk of mechanical, there's nothing more mechanical than humans. There's a in lot fact, of truth 